I'm a reformed string neurotic. Okay. You know, <laughs> I, I, I tried, I've probably tried just about every string under the sun. Yeah. They've all been on my bass at one point or another. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. So glad to have you here today. And visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me at feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Let me know a little bit about yourself, where you're from. That would be great. And I know you're going to love today's episode featuring Adam Booker. Adam teaches double bass and jazz at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And he previously served as a bassist in the U.S. Navy down in New Orleans. We had a chance to catch up in person in Prague at Base 2016. It was just so great to sit down with Adam and do this full interview. We dig into all sorts of topics like traditional jazz bass lines. That was what Adam presented at Prague and what those players actually did in the early days of jazz. We talk about Adam's path through Texas, gigging life, the military, and how he got into the world of academia. We also talk about just how cold Duluth, Minnesota actually is, especially for a guy from Texas. Stefan Harris, the great vibraphone player, and how he talks about scales being a collection of emotions. So many great takeaways from this interview. I know you're going to love it. And you'll also hear excerpts from Adam's album, Unraveled Rival, which features Pete Rodriguez on trumpet, Marcus Wilcher on tenor sax, Andre Hayward on trombone, Ryan Frayne on piano, and Tommy Howard on guitar, as well as David Sierra on drums. I'd also like to take a moment and thank Dario Strings for sponsoring Contrabass Conversations and let you know about their helicore strings, which I've used for years. They're multi-stranded steel core strings. They're made in New York at the D'Addario factory. They come in orchestral, hybrid, pizzicato, and solo string sets. And you can get all except the solo strings in light, medium, and heavy gauges. Check them out. Link in the show notes. And thanks also to Rob Anzalotti of BassCapos.com for providing hosting for Contrabass Conversations. And bass capos are an excellent choice for any bass player looking to use a double bass extension. They're easy to install, easy to adjust, they're cheaper and more reliable than hand-built latches, and they're also lighter and quicker to operate. So learn more at BaseCapos.com. All right, here we go with our conversation with Adam Booker. Here you are, Duluth, Minnesota. Okay, and I've spent time in like January, February in New Orleans, and I've spent time in January, February in Duluth, Minnesota. So, what do you ever do? You ever hit like a low point in that January, February time of year where you just like are dreaming of Mardi Gras? And <laughs> how how does that work for you? What what a change that must have been. Yeah, it was a bit of a culture shock at first. I think, you know, the first winter that we were here, um, it didn't really snow that much at uh-huh. first. So like, okay, great, we're, we're surviving, not a big deal. And then it got really cold. Like, our, my, I can't, uh, I never forget my first negative 20 degree day. <laughs> I was like, it's wow, it's negative 20. Like if I spit, it's ice before it hits the ground. <laughs> Oh, and uh, sound travels different when it's that cold because there's no moisture in the air. And uh, it, it was mind blowing. And for about for about two weeks of that, I'm kind of hating life and hating life. And it's like, this is just too cold. I can't believe how cold it is. Like I wouldn't leave my house unless it was to get to the car or to get from the car to my office or, you know. Um, and then about two weeks into that, we hit zero degrees. Oh. And I never knew how warm zero degrees could possibly feel after a couple of weeks of negative 20. Like, oh, this isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zero degrees. Okay. No problem. You know, so I'm actually quite pleasant after negative 20. And then it goes back to negative 20 for a while. And then it goes back to zero. And then that first day where it's 30 degrees outside and you you feel like you can walk outside in shorts and flip flops. Yeah. Because the body just adjusts. Um, yeah, we've been pretty lucky the past couple of winters hasn't been nearly quite as ridiculous. But the other thing about the first the first winter here that threw me for a loop was because it was so cold, and I didn't know this was a thing living in the South my whole life, it can be too cold to snow. 
Mm-hmm. Like, because there's zero moisture in the air. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember wondering, well, okay, so it's too cold to snow. What happens when March hits? And it's like consistently in the 20s and the 30s. And that's when the snow started. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't stop until like almost May. Like it's, it's in the middle of April. I think we had our first major snowstorm, even though we'd had some, some, you know, six inches here, six inches there, but we had a, a snowstorm in the middle of April. And I'm thinking, Whoa, it's April. It's supposed to be 90 degrees. I'm supposed to be down at the river tubing on the weekends or something. <laughs> and, uh, and it, of course that coincided with my, my first call to ever, you know, be a judge at a, at a, a university jazz festival, uh, over in the, on the upper peninsula. So I'm driving through a snowstorm, the first snowstorm of the year in the middle of April, all the way across northern Wisconsin and into the Upper Peninsula, and the thing's just following me the whole way. Oh man, that's you're you're bringing back all sorts of like post <laughs> right? traumatic memories, for, like like that that thing with the like it's too cold to snow. You learn that if you're from that. I mean, Chicago is like like South Florida compared to Duluth, you know. But it's, <laughs> it's, it has its fair share of cold weather. And I remember like looking at like it's like January. Those first couple of weeks of January are like the dangerous yeah. one, right? Yeah. And it, you look outside, and it's like this beautiful sunny day, and I usually think like. Oh no, you know, and you like open the door. And for me, it's like, yeah, it's amazing. Like what a zero degree day, like, like feels after those like negative temp. I remember walking to rehearsal downtown Chicago with another bass player and it was like three degrees. And we were both like so happy that it was three because it had been like negative 20, negative 25 or whatever. And for me, it's just like emergency. Like I, I, I can't feel, I don't know. Can you feel the difference between like negative 20 and negative 30 and negative 10? To me, it just feels like, my life is in danger. Yeah, I, I no, I, I don't feel any difference at that point. I call it, I call it negative fu. <laughs> so when it gets like below negative ten, it's like that's just you know the universe pressing the smite button on you. Yeah. It's, it, it just sucks no matter what. So. <laughs> well, it's like the opposite problem, uh, probably of Louisiana. I remember talking to Dave Anderson, and he oh, yeah. said you got to run from the car to the building as quickly as possible to just get from air conditioning to air conditioning. So yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. that's and you know I, I I only spent four years in New Orleans. Um, most of my most of my adult life was in Texas. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's the same thing. It's it's, it's weird because I'm on the exact opposite end of I-35 from where I used to live, pretty mm-hmm. much, mm-hmm. and it's the exact opposite climate. Like yeah. we we fear the cold in Texas. We fear like the you know the hundred degree days. When we left Texas, it was 120 degrees. <laughs> oh, and we got up here and it was 75 and gorgeous. So. And that's how they get you up here. They they do the job interview during the summertime. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing beautiful like that part of the country and like like being on the Great Lakes and like and just I mean, that's it's just as gorgeous as can be in the, oh, in the summertime. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, you can see people oh, two weeks of it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's funny being out here in San Francisco because like it, like it rained for the first time in like five months and that makes the that that's like the the front page headlines it's like wow. rain's coming and you know like a little bit of rain came and but like everybody's talking about it's like did you hear about the rain are you ready stay off the roads folks it's mm-hmm. gonna be crazy with a little and coming from or now that you're like like an adopted midwesterner now like yeah, like, yeah. you know it's just you think like what <laughs> Well, so so you grew up in Texas. T- tell me about where you grew up, musical background, double bass. When you discovered yeah. that kind of stuff, it's 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 quite it's quite a it's quite a fun tale. So I was born in Fort Polk, Louisiana. My dad was an army bandmaster. Yeah, and that was his first assignment after becoming an army bandmaster was the whatever the army band was there at Fort Polk. And uh, so that's where we were born, and or where I was born, and my sister was born there too. And then we ended up moving to Germany for four years. Uh, he got the job uh, directing the band, uh, Third Armored Division Band, out there in Germany, and that was in the early '80s. And then after that, we moved to New York. Uh, he was in charge of the band at Fort Hamilton there for a while, and that's uh, and then so three years of that, and then then we ended up at Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, Dad got the job running the uh, the Army's Jazz Ambassadors, which is like one of the top jazz bands in the in the world, hands down. I mean. You look at the lineup of that group. It's like he was in the one o'clock lab band. He was in the one o'clock lab band. He was this guy was so good. He didn't even go to college, you know, <laughs> that kind of band. So that's that's where I started playing music. But I've always grown up with it in the house. Yeah. Um, Dad was a big jazz fan. And he actually he was really into like the, the 70s horn bands. So like Blood, Sweat and Tears and Tower of Power and all mm-hmm. those guys. But of course, since he was running the Jazz Ambassadors, there was always some kind of big band record playing in the house growing up. Um and 
the best part about that gig is that's that's when I started really uh, recognizing music for what it was to me, mm-hmm. you know, just something internally that I had to do. Um, I got to spend my summers in front of that band because, oh, cool. you know, dad had to work, mom had to work, where are you going to put the kids? Uh, I'll come to work with you, Pop. You know, yeah. so I'm, I'm, you know, here I am like 10, 12, 11, 13 years old, just sitting in front of the, uh, this world-class big band watching my dad run a big band all day long. So... That kind of uh, set me on a path pretty quick. That's awesome. Wait, 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 what, what, did you? What was his instrument? Uh, he was a trumpet player. Trumpet player. Okay. Okay. Uh, now he's more of a composer. He, he writes music for. He's retired. He was teaching down at uh, University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, and uh, now he's retired back home to San Antonio. We call San Antonio home base. That's okay. Kind of where the whole family's from. Okay. And uh, so he's just sit, he sits at his house, writes music all day. Bummer. Yeah, I know. Well, so yeah, yeah, you can see your the family influence in your background, like going into the Navy. Did you did you think about military bands as like a uh, was that something that you were seriously considering from an early age or no, not at all. That's uh, I just I always knew that that was an option. Yeah, I was quite literally not doing too well in in college. I just really wasn't feeling the college thing. Um, mm-hmm. It took me three attempts to get a bachelor's degree. So my first attempt. I wasn't really interested in going to class like so many young musicians can be from time to time. I was already, uh, I really quickly got into the gigging scene in Austin, my freshman year of college. And at that point, you know, I had that attitude of like, well, I'm already playing jazz for a living. Why do I need to go to school for it? You know, and better or worse, that's not necessarily a bad way to think. It's just, I didn't want to waste money and I was more interested in playing than going to 8 a.m. theory. So, uh, you know, Dropped out and then went on the road with a band called the Asylum Street Spankers, which was like a 10-piece vaudeville, western swing country jazz band that used no amplification whatsoever. Whoa. So I was 19 years old, touring all around the country with that with that outfit. And it was that that was kind of an eye-opener about the music business for me. You know, 19 years old and, and hitting the road with that kind of group. Um, when I got a year off the road, I was on the road with them for about a year and I got back I got off the road and I went back to college because that's what you do. You go back to school because you can't think of anything else to do. And right. financial aid checks are pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in the interim, uh, during that year, I uh, met and started dating my first wife. And things got pretty heavy and we decided to get married. And at that point, I was like, well, I'm spending all this time and money going to school when I could be spending time gigging and making money. Mm-hmm. So uh, dropped out of school again and just started gigging around the San Antonio and Austin corridor. And then the gigs dried up. Bought a house, married, gigs dried up. So then what do I do? Well, I knew that the military band was an option. So I went to a recruiting office and said, hi, I'm a bass player. I would like to be in the band. So so that if someone is thinking about joining one, because there are so many military bands, that's the thing. I think sometimes people think, oh, it's just there are these few groups in D.C., but there are all these regional oh, bands, yeah. right? They're like in every state, right? Yeah, they're all over the place. I mean, it's it's significantly less than it used to be. They've been facing some cuts lately. But I know, you know, I think right now the Navy has 10 bands stationed around the world outside of just the D.C. groups and the Annapolis groups. Uh Lord knows how many bands the Army has. I have no idea. Air Force has about 10 or 15, somewhere in there, and Marine Corps. Every service uh, in the Department of Defense has a band program. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, the Coast Guard, it's it's they only have one, and they're up in Groton, but up in Connecticut. But most of these bands are world-class bands these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them, some out in the field, maybe not so much. They'll take an 18-year-old that's quote-unquote trainable. Yeah. And you go to the Armed Forces School of Music for six months. And but, you know, with the with the job market, the gig market uh, being the way it is, you're finding more and more people with master's degrees joining the military band program, especially with uh, uh, incentives like uh, loan forgiveness and signing bonuses and things like that, depending on what instrument you play. So you're you're actually very likely to find very highly skilled, highly qualified musicians wearing uniforms these days. Yeah. My wife uh, made the finals for the army band harp position, which I was, oh, wow. was not aware that there was a harp position yep. until it was advertised. Uh, yep. But but yeah, and and it, that was like yeah, especially 
I've got several friends out out in DC that play, you know, play in yeah. the band and they do other gigs and that. Mm-hmm. So, so that's interesting. Is there any so because you see these jobs advertised sometimes in international musician, the union paper, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. But you can also just go to a recruiting office and say, "I play, I play trumpet, I play bass." You can, but be careful what the recruiter says. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. Like, like, yeah. Well, it was funny because I, I originally I originally looked into the army because you know dad did it can't be too bad he did it for twenty one years so I went to the army off, the army recruiting office first and I said hey I'm a bass player I'd like to be in the military music program and it's kind of funny because the recruiter was like well you know you have to go into infantry first and then we can uh, cross rate you over to the band program after you're already in and in your infantry unit and I'm sitting there like. Uh, no, it, it doesn't work like that. And he's like, well, yeah, that's exactly how it works. I'm like, no, I know that that's not how it works. Like, well, how do you know how it works? Well, my dad's a retired army band officer, so <laughs> I can tell you exactly how it works probably better than you can tell me. But anyway, yeah, I was, I was kind of young and yeah. Time. So list, listeners be, beware, don't accidentally join the infantry if you don't want yeah, right. to, if yeah, don't to. go infantry. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, the first, the first, your first stop would probably, if that's something that you were interested in would all these all these music programs have their own website you know navy.mil backslash music or something like that go to the just google navy music program and they'll they'll get you in touch with uh, the music program coordinator and i believe the army and the air force have something along the similar lines yeah okay and talk to them first and they'll say well let's take an audition first and then you take your audition paper to the recruiting office and say okay i audition i'm good to go i'm going to be in the band thank you very much let's sign the papers uh there we go okay yeah. good <laughs> Yeah, talk to the musicians first, not the recruiter. Right. <laughs> what, what was the name of that group that you were touring with down in Texas for the first time? Uh, the Asylum Street Spankers. Okay, so you're so you're you're playing in the okay. So maybe for so what, what was a typical gig like for the Asylum Street Spankers? <laughs> oh man! So like I said, we didn't we we toured with zero. We didn't use any amplification whatsoever. So like we did variably end up at uh, some club and we played some pretty big rooms. Um, you know, 600 seat bar, big club type places. Yeah. Sometimes we played some pretty seedy dive bar. We played the hideout in Chicago a couple times. Okay, so, sure. You know, th- those kind of venues. It's kind of interesting because we were kind of hipsters before hipsters were cool. Yeah. You know, so there's a lo- there's a whole lot of Hawaiian shirts walking around. There's a whole lot of you know this is the mid 90s, so you know chain wallets and, <laughs> and fedoras. The the movie Swingers was like huge at the time. The yeah. Nuts were big at the time. And we were kind of riding that, you know, swing nouveau wave. So there would be anywhere between 100 to 600 people in the room. And we, everybody, you know, we had banjo player, ukulele player, cross cut saw, uh, two guitars, cocktail snare, washboard, bass, and, and fiddle, and clarinet. And uh, yeah, huge group. And, and uh, we'd play a nice big chord, and we'd have one guy named Mysterious John. I toured with this band for six months before I knew half the band's real names. Uh, <laughs> his name was we call his name was Mysterious John. He'd walk out uh, on the stage with a big megaphone, ladies and gentlemen, and give this spiel like a total carnival barker spiel about you know please be quiet. We're you know we're we're playing music the way God intended it to be without the use of demon electricity, <laughs> you know. And then we'd go into a number and it'd just be boom 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 after that and. Uh, you know, the subject matter is definitely not family material. Yeah. Our number one, hit, I think at the time was called funny cigarette, if that's any implication. Okay. <laughs> but it was, it was great because I, I had to learn how to produce a tone out of my bass that could be, that could hopefully cut through all of these instruments. And I was too poor to afford uh, gut strings. And I didn't want to jack my action like super high because I was a real I was a real jazz snob at the time. Yeah. So what did how, what did you do? How on earth do you cut through? You know, without like physically mutilating yourself. Well, after I physically mutilated myself. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> it, you know, it's it's amazing what happens when you it, where tone actually comes from on the bass. Sometimes it depends on how you're conceptualizing it. You know, I did a lot of the slap bass stuff with that band. Whole lot of slap bass uh, with that band. Um, and I, I, I came to understand, at least as f- for me, that tone came more from what you do with your left hand than what you do with your right hand. Mm, mm-hmm. you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're on point on your intonation, then the sound of the instrument is going to cut through a lot better than if you're flat or sharp or anything like that. It's going to weave right through, the, the I guess, the waveforms of all the other instruments mm-hmm. and provide that, that support that the rest of the instruments need a lot more. Um, you know... I think it was uh, John Clayton. I saw him in a clinic one time. He held up his left hand and said, tone. 
and he held up his right hand and said, tone producer. Nice. You know, and I, that kind of stuck with me. And I'm still, that's still an ongoing process with me is just really learning how to solidify the, those fundamentals. And then, of course, you know, then you slap the living snot out of your instrument, you know, just bang. And I, for the first couple of weeks I had, I was blistered like nobody's business in my right hand. I mean, it was getting, my fingers were getting wrapped every night. But after that, you know, the calluses grow, they get better, they get they get the right consistency, not necessarily like rock hard, but a good leathery feel to them. And it just goes. And sometimes you don't have to live with the fact that maybe people can't hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, like, what do you what do you tell a student? Because like, like, you know, we've all probably been there with this d- disaster zone right hand, right? Where you're like played and then blister and they pop. Like, if you got a student who's starting to set out on on that kind of gig or even any kind of like heavy pizzicato gig, what do you what do you tell them to do just to like avoid, you know, damage? Yeah, um, well. I don't really tell them what to do to avoid damage. I haven't really thought that through, to be honest with you. I think, uh, you know, base setup is very important. Yeah. We live in an age now where you don't have to have, you know, super high string height to, in order to play loud. It helps. And if it's an all acoustic gig, there's, there's string options available. And I tend to, I tend to try to steer them towards that. Like, Everybody's bass is different, but I've, t- I've, I've uh, realized on my bass that it actually plays louder with lighter gauge strings. Oh, interesting. A large period of trial and error. You know, especially a lot of older instruments, I'm wondering if that's a thing because a lot of older instruments were designed with lighter tension gut strings in mind. Mm-hmm. So we throw these, you know, we throw these 63 pound strings on them now and it kind of, it can choke the top and not really resonate as freely as that when they first came, when they were first built. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's a thing. I don't know. I, I don't have a, a huge stock of 200 year old bases. So. <laughs> It's interesting, though, because, yeah, I think, you know, I like go to order some new strings and I just in my mind, I think, oh, I want a bigger sound. I'm going to get the heavier gauge. But that's that's an interesting point, especially. Yeah. Maybe you're like letting the instrument ring a little bit more if you're like taking that that tension off a little bit. I've I've found that to be true, at least on my base. Your mileage may vary. So, yeah. Yeah. And I I go back and forth every year. I have I call it my gut string phase of the year. Like maybe I'm listening to like uh, some. Uh, it's usually it's usually sparked by either listening to Ahmad Jamal Trio or Paul Chambers, of course. And then it's like, oh, I want that sound. I should go buy gut strings. So now I just kind of keep a spare set away instead of like spending five hundred dollars a year on that um, <laughs> and reselling them on talk base. You know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a, a spendy investment if you start to go oh. down that road, and uh, can be a fussy investment depending what kind it, of gut strings. It is, and I, I was I was a. I was, I'm a reformed string neurotic, okay. you know, I, I, I tried, I've probably tried just about every string under the sun. Yeah. They've all been on my base at one point or another. Thankfully now I'm endorsed by Diodario. So that kind of put the kibosh on that and I'm like, yay, I don't have to worry about strings anymore. It, and it's amazing what happens when you limit yourself to one thing and say, I have to practice on these to make them make the sound that I want them to make. Yeah. Yeah. The tink- the tinkering thing. And I think it it happens to all of us, probably not just in music, in every aspect of life, even with this podcasting thing. I'm like, if I start to experiment, like all of a sudden I'm like trying everything. And the same thing, like I know people, I've never been like the biggest string tinkerer or string neurotic. That's a good term. I like that. I was talking to Douglas Mapp about strings maybe like six months ago, and he, he had an interesting comment and I've, I've i've thought about this a lot ever since he said that for him the strings they really affect how you sound under your ear and maybe how yeah. you approach the bass but the actual perceived effect in the audience is way less than you think like you get Absolutely. in the hall and it's really you're hearing the bass more and i've thought a lot about that ever since hearing it i bet the tension like you're talking about can probably change the sound too but yeah i guess it must change the way we we approach the bass but uh maybe it lessens as you get away yeah i don't know i, I i've done i've done some things where like i would set up and and put like some kind of recording device at different distances away from the instrument mm-hmm. and yeah it's it's night and day what you hear under your ear is not what the audience is going to hear 20 feet out yeah and it's the same thing with amplifiers and stuff like that what you hear sitting right there at your feet is definitely not what the audience is going to hear 20 feet out yeah that's a fun that's a i love doing that experiment with students like when we're talking yeah. about projection and that sort of thing and have them walk away from the instrument and have other people 
So I, so I got to ask, because so you're, you know, you're doing your undergrad and you leave to go tour with hipsters, swing bands, and then you come back and leave. And now, you know, you go the full on academic route. You get your get your DMA and you're a professor now. And, you know, which is such a cool thing to get. Um, what what set you down that academic path, especially since it seemed like you were kind of resistant to the whole s- formal school thing early on? Well, you know, um, Uncle Sam's Navy taught me a couple of very important lessons, uh, the most fundamental of which is I can wake up on time and do my job. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I think that I, I, at that age, I was struggling a lot with uh, I was drinking heavily and I was doing other things that, you know, we don't want to talk about too much. But Uncle Sam had a really good way of putting at least some kind of controls in my life yeah. and disciplining and learning how to be disciplined. I wasn't the best practicer. I wasn't the best uh, at you know setting my alarm. I wasn't the best exerciser. I wasn't really doing a lot for my professional, uh, I guess, reputation back then. But I would show up to gigs. But, you know, I got out of the Navy and I felt like – or a year before I got out of the Navy, I felt like, okay, I can do this. I can go back to college and I can do, I can do all of it this time around. And I kind of – you know, I made a promise to my CEO on the way out. Yeah, I'm going to go all the way on this one. I'm not stopping until I'm Dr. Booker. Honor, courage, and commitment are the Navy's core values and I kind of kind of had those stuck in the back of my brain. Military is really good at brainwashing you that way. It's a yeah. good thing. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> definitely what I needed at the time. Yeah. Well, it's so tough, like with the jazz and as someone like I'm one to 5% of my playing is jazz playing, right? It's like pretty low, not zero, but very low. But the, the, just the lifestyle associated with the jazz gigging scene or any sort of late night scene, you know, like I go to an orchestra rehearsal and it's maybe 10 AM to 1 PM. And then a mm-hmm. concert concert 10 PM is kind of like, we're starting to complain yeah. after a 10 PM concert. <laughs> and who put uh, Mahler on this program? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But when you're playing till two a.m. and you're doing, I mean, it's just it's a it's a lifestyle that's a little less out of the what you think of like a stereotypical normal work day. Oh, I, yeah, I know. I mean, in New Orleans, you know, gigs would easily go to four o'clock in the morning, yeah. and then I'd have to be up for PT at five thirty. Oh, <laughs> there were there were times I wouldn't even go to bed. I would just kind of go straight to the base and and, and you know the military base, not the upright base. Uh, I'd go straight to to the headquarters and and uh just kind of maybe catch a quick nap on the couch in the band hall and then get up and get in pt gear and go jog but i don't know i feel like sometimes uh we do that to ourselves in the jazz scene like there's this mystique about what we do and we try our hardest to perpetuate that mystique yeah uh, a lot of the top cats that i know now don't do the hang you know mm-hmm. it's it, it, it's not that it's not done. It's just, gosh, darn it. We're all old and we have families and they'd like to see us and they deserve to see us from time to time. So it's not really like that for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Hanging out after the gig just doesn't happen. Yeah. It's, it seems like people sort of come to that realization or they don't, but they they do, or they do when the family or when you start to hit a certain age. And I was just talking with Ruben Rogers. I just interviewed Ruben. And so we were talking Mm -hmm. kind of about similar, similar things. And, and then you throw being in the road and into that whole mix and it can, Oh yeah. So you're in the academic job now and you've got the, which is, which is great and such a great setup for someone who, well, great setup for anybody, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, what, but maybe what's the thing that, what surprised you the most taking that? Was this your first academic this, job? Yeah. Okay. So what, what was the first, what was maybe something unexpected about actually being a professor? What really threw you for a loop? Um, at, at the risk of losing my job over this, but just how disorganized things can be sometimes. <laughs> Uh, just with colleagues and stuff and everybody's, ah, you know, and it's not, it's not anything that's wrong with academia or with the music department or the program or anything like that. But my first major surprise was just the realization that in a lot of academic institutions, people are just kind of there for their little kingdom and their agenda. And they make that, you know, their priority, which is fine if that's what you want to do. I'm from the military. I grew up military. I served in the military and I'm used to mission, team, core values, all those kind of things that we all work together for the betterment of the unit and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes in academia, that's a little bit, uh, I find that a little bit lacking. And that was kind of a huge surprise for me. So everybody's doing their job and that's, that's great, but everybody's just doing their job. And sometimes it feels like, Hey, we could, we could together make this somewhat better. So, you know, keep it 
mouth shut, learning how to do that was kind of a really quick, uh, hard lesson that I'm still working on. Like, uh, don't you think we should? Oh, never mind. Not my job. Not my job. Not my job. <laughs> just teach the bass players. Just wear the jazz band. So, I think the term herding cats is very, I think that was created for faculty meetings. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So you presented at at Prague about mm -hmm. early jazz bass techniques. What what did you talk about exactly? Well, um, let me preface with having played a lot of earlier jazz, a lot of trad jazz, yeah. uh, a lot of New Orleans style. That I've come to, I came to understand that a lot of people really have no clue what they're talking about when they tell the bass player what they want for their for their. Uh, you know, band. No, it's just two beat. They only played two beat back then. No, they all played tuba and then they went to bass back then. You know, it's, I've told my students in the past that jazz doesn't have history. It has mythology. Mm, yeah. You know, we, yeah. We, of course we have history. You know, you can read the great books by Ted Joy or all those guys that really researched Lawrence Gushy that really researched it. But for the most part, it goes back into that, uh, when we were talking about the music, the, the jazz scene, right? It's that mystique that we place upon the music and the musicians that play it. And that translates into audience and other musicians expectations of how you're supposed to perform on your instrument that generally speaking are, are incorrect. They're just factually incorrect. So, you know, what I, what I did was what anybody can do with a MP3 player and YouTube and a CD player and, access to all kinds of records is actually go back and listen to what the great early jazz bass players were doing. And it was like a revelation for me. Uh, these guys were not just, they weren't just string tubas. They weren't uh, just uh, playing two beat stuff. They were playing a lot of walking type lines. They didn't just stick to the roots on every chord. They did a lot of line work. They did a lot of arpeggios. They did a lot of great stuff. And they also did all the slapping things. And it wasn't like the bass was just an accompaniment instrument. It was another. Uh, it was another line on the contrapuntal form of early Dixieland jazz or early traditional jazz. So I think they approached it the same way as a trumpet player was approaching, and a clarinet player and a trombone player. They were just approaching it like a bass player was setting up the foundation for what we now know as a uh, jazz bass sound. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, cool. So obviously times have changed in terms of gear. We have different options. So maybe you wouldn't be recommending what somebody, you know, like in a Dixieland band was using. But like if, if someone's going to mostly play that kind of style of music and you being a reformed uh, string neurotic, what are some recommendations you give to someone who is going to focus on that? Oh, goodness. Yeah. If that's all you're going to do, go gut or go home. Yeah, really? You know, yeah. I mean, and just, but I do it on, you know, Diodario Helicor Pizzicatos and it's just fine. Like I said, tone is in your hand. There's a way to make it sound pretty close. Um, it has to do a little bit of left hand muting technique and things like that to kind of get that thumpier sound. Okay. It's still going to sound like steel strings, but it's going to be a lot closer. If that's all you were going to do, though, definitely gut strings gut strings on top and maybe you know velvets on the bottom i found to be very stable because a lot a lot of times your e and a gut strings will, will break apart with heavy slapping okay okay yeah. And it is there, and I'm forgive my ignorance, but this is all like way, way out of my uh, comfort zone. Is that set up at all somewhere like what like a rockabilly player would play on, or is that like pretty different? Because I mean, I I know that what would you, what, do you do any of that kind of playing? Or I have, yeah. It's it's kind of weird. Um, you know, rockabilly players hate playing on my bass because my 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 strings are like really low. Yeah, and yet I'm still. <laughs> you know, machine gunning it all the time. Yeah. Um, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, again, it goes back to the mystique of things. You, it doesn't have to be super high. Don't kill yourself. Even with gut strings playing straight ahead jazz. Um, I had the fortune of studying with Ben Wolf for a minute and he's definitely one of those New York gut string jazz warriors. And it, I asked him straight up. So how high are your strings? Like, Oh, they're not that high, man. You know, like yeah, that, you know, they're, they're not that high at all. And, um, you can produce a big tone without having to have large uh, string height. On the flip side of that, it might may or may not be as loud, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but it could still be big. There's a, to me, I have a there's a difference between big and loud, you know. Yeah, sure. And you know, you do what the gig calls for, I guess. Like I said, I played trad gigs with steel strings, and when I when I was at Milt Hinton's house when in when I was 19, he had uh, Spirecore Vikes on his bass, 
and he's definitely like historically one of the top jazz bass players that ever existed, you know, and slapped the living snot out of that thing. Yeah. <laughs> and he was using Spyro Chorus. So. <laughs> oh, how cool is that to be hanging out at Milt Hinton's place at 19? How did that come about? Dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Milt Hinton. That was uh, that was fun. So there was this bass player in Austin uh, named Rob Jewett who somehow managed to get Milt's phone number. And that's when I was on the road with the Spankers. And uh, so I had known who Milton was. He was like one of my early bass heroes right off the bat. So my dad, uh, no, yeah, my dad introduced me to Milton at a young age, the music, not the man. So I got the phone number from Rob. And there I am sitting in my apartment in San Marcos. Uh, okay, I'm going to dial the number. I'm like, uh, I'm going to talk to Milton. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> I, I, on the other line, Milton picks up the phone. Uh, hello? I'm like, click. Because <laughs> I'm so freaking nervous. This is like the first heavy that I've ever actually called. Yeah. You know? No, it's cool. I'll call up anybody. It doesn't matter. I won't be, you know, but you know, back then it was like, I'm, I'm about to talk to a living legend, you know, yeah. like one of my biggest heroes. And so I'm like, okay, breathe, 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 pick up the phone again, dial his number and call him back and say, I, I'm Mr. Hint. My name is Adam Booker. I'm from Texas. I'm going to be in New York on such and such day on tour. I'd like to get a lesson. You know, he's like, Oh, that's cool, man. Let me let me let you talk to Mona. She she said all that up for you. <laughs> so now I'm talking to Mil and Mona, right? And so Mona's really gracious on the phone. We set it all up, and yeah, there I am uh, in New York a few weeks later. Uh, where were we playing? The, somewhere on Houston Street up in New York, and uh, was it the Star Bar? Doesn't matter. Anyway, so I'm staying in Hoboken, and I have to learn how to take the train out to Jamaica Queens. I've never been on the I hadn't been on the subway since I was like four. And uh, so I'm taking the subway out to Jamaica, Queens, and and finally make it over to Mill's house. And they're having dinner and watching Jeopardy. And this is something they do every night. They watch Jeopardy while they eat dinner. And it was the most it was the most excellent setup that I could possibly imagine because the subjects were like 20th century composers and musical <laughs> terms. And so I'm just sitting there like, oh, I know the answer to this one. I'm answering every question. Mill looks over, puts down, man, you a smart little son of a bitch, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but what a hang man you know it, it, this is about probably six months before he passed too okay yeah it was just great i got I, he took me to the, to the middle room in the house and showed me some things man he was ruthless like play a blues scale or play no play a play a blues and g and i start playing a blues and g stop stop why you play that note man that note don't belong i mean just ruthless cutthroat showed me some exercises like you know just playing a scale going up using first finger and coming back down up a half step going up back down just using first finger really got my intonation a little bit more together that way great exercise i still make my students do it too <laughs> yeah um, and they showed me some slap stuff you know i mean I, being a bass player an upright bass player in austin texas you can't really get away from the slap bass thing it's that that town is like a mecca of slap bass players the great kevin smith down there and uh mark rubin those two guys really kind of uh made it a thing in austin texas and there's a bunch of great slot players down there josh hogue and all these guys so and then we went down to his basement and he's like starts pulling out all these pictures and he's like quizzing me who's that oh that's cab Keller. who's that that's cootie williams who's that I mean, i'm getting like the third degree <laughs> test test from the judge himself and i'm seeing these are all the pictures that he took when he was on the road with Cab Calloway and all those guys, you know, it's like, I'm just, I'm in awe at this oh, point. Man. And then I have to go play a gig. And I'm playing a gig like five feet off the ground because <laughs> I'm just floating. <laughs> I remember I, when I was an early teenager reading, I think it was Strings Magazine, they, they, they there was a feature on Milt Hinton, and I think it had some photos that he'd taken from the years on the road. And I remember reading about his practicing, and it was like one of the first – real in-depth bass articles I read. I just started playing bass. I remember just reading that over and over again and thinking how cool it would be to meet that guy. How cool to... It was pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. It was wicked cool. Like, it stuck with me my whole life. I mean, what, 20 years later, and I'm still like, I got yeah. to hang out with Lynn. That was so cool. Yeah, like answering Jeopardy questions and like, yeah. like impressing the, the pants on the head. That's all. <laughs> what? I, I don't know if he was that impressed with that. <laughs> I mean, yes. Certainly wasn't impressed with my intonation at the time, that's for sure. Man, you got to play in tune. You want to play the bass. Yes, sir. <laughs>
So, so you use some of those exercises or that exercise you're talking about with uh, that you got from Milt. What else? What do you do? And I know every student's different, right? Everybody comes at a different point, or whatever. But if you could suss out some commonalities, like in terms of like teaching technique or mm -hmm. improv, kind of a wide subject. But like, what do you what do you like to work on with your students when they drop in there? like freshman year uh, freshman year well i i actually try to run like a battery of scales okay okay I, actually i just started doing that this year it's like benchmark scale examinations so i had to make tests out of them but it just kind of occurred to me at, at one point it's like man you guys aren't aren't shedding your scales like you should mm -hmm. so i'm gonna fix that so you know freshman year uh first semester it's all major scales up to the ninth with various different bowings all 12 major scales and then all 12 harmonic minor scales up to the ninth with various bowings and just just one octave up to the ninth right and then the second semester it's all all two octave major and harmonic minor and then uh after that it starts getting more complicated like range of the instrument scales like you start you start C major, but on open E and just go all the way up and back down. When you get back down, start D flat all the way up and back down, all that kind of stuff. And then your two octave major scales and arpeggios and all that stuff. So um, I stress those a lot. I need to stress those a little bit harder on some of these guys, if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> and I know they will be. Yeah, so scales, big time on scales. I try to pick a uh, repertoire that's appropriate for their skill level. Sometimes I get a little too ambitious for them. <laughs> I'm sure we've all had that teacher like, here, you're playing Botticini this semester. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, okay, sure, sure I'm not. It just depends on where they're at. You know, up here in northern Minnesota, it's not a, it, there's a great strings scene for the high school kids, but there's not a lot of interest in um, becoming a string player for a living. Mm -hmm. We're in rural Minnesota. It's a lot of mining activity, a lot of uh, blue collar work ethic up here which is great gotta love the work ethic we get a we get a good number of students from the twin cities as well and they, they're a little bit uh for lack of a better term they're a little bit hipper to the idea of of being a musician for life sure um, sure it's a tough sell for a lot of the high school kids around here because they're being told no you're gonna get into mining you're gonna get into this you're gonna do this that has that makes money right not like well you're a bass player you're gonna make money everybody needs you so the it's kind of a mixed bag the the skill level that i get at the beginning, when I first got here, started to get my name out as a, as a new professor in the area, a lot of my bass players that I was getting at the time actually never even touched an upright until they got to college. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty normal, too. That, I find that a lot. They played electric bass a lot in high school. So oh, I'm going to go get a degree in jazz studies. OK, cool. You play upright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're gonna. <laughs> here you go. So I get a lot of 18 year old beginners. And yeah, with that, it's scales and vomit exercises till you puke. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that and that I to totally hear what you're saying. I taught at University of Wisconsin Whitewater for oh, five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So and would get, exactly yeah, like central Wisconsin, a little more, probably not as as rural as what you're talking about. But a lot of people who are like electric bass players now that they're here. Now you're going to learn how to play bass. You got a jury in two years and you got a proficiency scale thing at the end of this year. And yeah. I would I would just think like, man, what do we do? So how about in terms of piece like like i've struggled so much with with students like that and like what there's what i would do with like a beginning student like i'm just starting a new student this week and i'm breaking out that george vance progressive repertoire yep, book yep. one you know yep. starting in third position i really mm -hmm. like that approach do you use pieces like that with your students or how do you how do you like fit i guess repertoire i'll call it or just pieces how do you fit that into their whole development yeah so you know some I found some students resonate really well with the Vance stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they just get it like that. I found some students do better with the Samandel stuff. They get the Samandel stuff just like that. I found some students the Sturm book, the Sturm Etudes, just like that. Really, until I'm better at this or more experienced at this, I I usually can't tell until maybe two or three weeks into the semester what they're going to be what's what's going to get them making music as fast as possible. Because that's my that's my job number one, at least as far as I see. I want them making music, not just playing the bass for the sake of playing the bass. No, you're gonna play. You're gonna make music here, even if it's a Samandel etude, you know, number three. Right. Yay! Right. We've all been there. Make music out of it. As far as repertoire is concerned, you know, they, I, I checked out Oren Oren O'Brien's book. I got some I got some good ideas out of that one. Once they get past a certain level, then I start hitting them hard with like the standard rep, you know, the Kusevitsky short pieces and, and all that stuff. And I find the shorter pieces have uh, been really beneficial to get them thinking in, in terms of playing longer pieces. So like I have one student right now that's doing 
you know, Chanson Trist and Vals Miniature and Humoresque all at the same time. And the next semester, I'm going to have her doing the uh, the whole Kusevitsky concerto. So we're spending a whole year with Kusevitsky uh, on top of exercises, etudes, and orchestral excerpts. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And I, I I sort of have a similar approach with, especially because you just don't know what's going to catch with that person. You want to get yep. that spark. You want to, and whether it's like you're saying, Sturm or Samandel, or it's some of the Vance position work. There's some, something else I, I've been talking with a couple of people recently. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Has have you found any of the classical technique books, whether it's or approaches to like I'm thinking of like Hal Robinson's Boardwalking or maybe maybe Sturm or maybe whatever. Is there anything you found that like kind of opens up a like someone's someone's got some improv ideas, but they're they're limited by their technique. Have you found any way of like teaching technique that opens up the base for the jazz players so that they're able to improvise more freely or walk? Um, You know. Uh, Ravath book three. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. With all the, all the, you know, the, all the different ways to start a scale and end a scale. Yeah. That I found that works really well with young, with young improvisers because that really opens up the fingerboard for them in different ways. And one of the things that I, I, I try to concentrate on when, with, with my players, as far as scales are concerned, yeah, I'd like you to play all 12 of your major minor scales all up and down the fingerboard, but let's see what happens if you just go up to the fifth and back. Mm-hmm. And do that in various different ways. You know, let's make because let's face it, we're bass players. We're going to play one to five a lot. Yeah. So let's see if we can let's see if we can go up to the fifth and back, and then down to the fifth and back. Mm. You know, and and really get that solidified, and in different ways. So, yeah. you know, as many different ways, little scale fragments like that. Instead of making them have to think about the whole scale. Think about little scale fragments. Just go up to the fifth and back, and now go up to the, from two to six, now back, and now three to uh, seven and back, and things like that, just to break the scale up and stop thinking linearly on the scale, but think of a scale as a circle, as a cycle. Ooh, yeah, I, I like that. That's great. Yeah, that's like a more functional use of the scales. Like you're actually, that's like actually the vocabulary you're going to be using. No one ever yeah, plays exactly. like a two octave scale and. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that is that is, I think, a, a weakness in a lot of pedagogy is, you know, when you get to the when you get to the uh, the jury and they're like, okay, let's hear some scales. <laughs> no, you're not playing a scale. You're playing a, you're playing a bunch of notes. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Stefan Harris, best quote of the year. Uh, this isn't just a scale. This is a collection of emotions. You know, and I I, I use that daily. And that's so true. He, there's a great YouTube video of him, like showing how to do uh, scales. On he's a great vibes player, and he talks about how each note in a scale has its own has its own uh, emotion to it, you know. And it, it's definitely it's worth checking out. I play it for every single student that walks in my door because, like, yes, this everything that this guy says in the next 15 minutes is exactly right. Oh, cool! I will link. I will link up to that for sure. I haven't seen that, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go check that out. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's it's the sound quality is horrible, but you can get the idea. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things you got to watch because he's actually making faces with each note. It's like, <laughs> it's a it's the best line in the in the universe. This isn't just a scale. This is a collection of emotions. Yeah, you know, these are these are the colors that you're painting with for music. You know, these are the colors that you're gonna that you're gonna use. These are all the tones on your palette. So don't just think of it as a group of individual notes in a line. It's it's you're looking you have a crayon box here full of all these different things that you can use. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's a that's a that's a quote. That's a that's a is that the Facebook quote? There, there's a, that's a that's got to be an Adam Booker quote of some. Yeah, it's got it. That's that. <laughs> You know, I used to just ask people like advice for for young musicians, but the thing I ripped off from some podcast is like, what would you ask your 20 year old or what advice would you give your 20 year old self? So <laughs> I don't know if you, and you probably got some good advice. Oh, like, what, what would you tell what would you tell 20 year old Adam? Well, there's a lot of things that I've wanted. Uh, I'll, I'll go full disclosure and you please go ahead and feel free to include this. I'm going to get really, really personal right now. You know, I'm. I, I consider myself a recovering alcoholic. I'm a very regular church goer. I've gone through lots and lots of therapy to really get in touch with what 20-year-old Adam did with his life, mm-hmm. right? And this is all very recent in the past couple of years. I don't really 
I've already had that discussion with 20 year old Adam, you know, I've gone inside the cave and and we had a nice long chat and everything that 20 year old Adam did created 38 year old Adam. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I I can't tell, I can't tell 20 year old Adam to do anything. 20 year old Adam's 18 years ago. What would I tell 38 and a half year old Adam? What I try to tell myself (laughs) every day is just be a good person and not just not just worry about creating great bass players, but creating great people because great people make great bass players. I mean, you saw it in Prague. Everybody was so cool. Every year at I, every other year at ISB, it's just like the most, most. It's like going to a Zen retreat or something because everybody's just like we're we're a small community. We're all so cool with each other all the time and very experimental. I mean, the instrument itself is as we know it is only fifty years old as far as I'm concerned. You know the repertoire is so is is so advanced now, and it's getting further and further and pushed to the limit daily. I mean, violin they've had hard stuff for a long time. You know, we're just getting to it. So, twenty year old Adam probably gets gets a pass. Twenty year old Adam did a lot of cool things. He did a lot of stupid things, but he gets a pass because he created thirty eight year old Adam that I'm very happy with right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, fu- it's funny you say that. You're the only person who's said that, but I think that's actually kind of my answer to that question yeah. too. Not that, I, you know, like, like what would you, you know, especially in terms of like, would you do anything differently? And I think no, because no. that all led to, you know, 40 year old Jason sitting right here talking with you, which right, is so right. cool. I'm so glad that we get to reconnect. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. I sent that Facebook message and then I'm looking and I'm seeing like old correspondence we had on Facebook Messenger like yeah. almost 10 years ago, which is yeah, hilarious. Right? Yeah, when so, I was doing when I seriously, I'm not kidding. I would drive to and from gigs all around Texas. And I would have the podcast loaded up on my MP, in whatever MP3 player, like one, one in ear in while I'm trying to drive at like three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> listening to your interview <laughs> on term or with, you know, Francois Rabat or all those guys, you know? Oh man. Well, yeah. thank you. That's, that's, I'm, I'm honored by that. And that's one of those, <laughs> that's one of those things that there's that disconnect of like actually doing this and then realizing it's g- going out to the, to the world in the way it is. It's, it's cool. Yeah, right? it's, it's cool to have you as a part of it, man. It's, oh, it's man, great. I, the honor is all mine, man. I, this, this is like bucket list check. Good. <laughs> Adam, such a pleasure to talk with you. And folks, you can learn more about Adam and everything that he's up to at adambookeronbass.com. That's going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. I'm so glad to have you here starting off the new year with a great friend like Adam. So excited for what's in store for 2017. Check out everything that's going on at ContrabassConversations.com. Our news show is going strong. I've got so many ideas for that. ContrabassConversations.com slash news for that. There's so many things happening in the world of the bass. That's where I'm putting that info now. I used to put it in the interview shows. I'm putting it on its own special place controversyconversations.com slash news. They're both audio and video episodes. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.